So good evening, everybody, and welcome to today's session. That is the concluding lecture of the ongoing Rainbow series of online guest lectures. And on this occasion, we have with us a very special guest, a very respected personality of India, of Jharkhand, Dr. Shreya Bhattacharji. Welcome, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Shreya Bhattacharji is Associate Professor in the Department of English Studies, Central University of Jharkhand, Ranchi, India. Her academic interests include post-colonial studies, especially African, Afro-American, Caribbean, queer, and women's writing, border and partition studies, and contemporary literary theories. She has published widely and has been invited to numerous conferences in India, as also in the United States, France, Hungary, South Africa, and South Korea. Formerly a civil services officer, she also nurtures a keen interest in human rights, tribal, and gender issues. And today's lecture, uh, the topic for today's lecture is locating texts in the post-colonial frame, perspectives, and challenges. We know our students are really thrilled, so am I, to hear Shreya, ma'am after a very long time. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, uh, Varsha. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am, you are. Thank Varsha, you. am I audible? Yes. Uh, thank you, Varsha, for this invitation. And uh, thank you, Guru Nanak College, for the platform. Uh, so without further ado, we will move on to what I have in mind today. And I hope we will have a really interesting session. Varsha, I would like to uh, do a slideshow. So can I share? Sure, ma'am. Sure, ma'am. OK, OK, thanks. Varsha, is it visible? Yes, ma'am, it is. It is visible. Varsha, is the slide visible? Uh, uh, right, right. So as uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, my dear students and friends. As Varsha just mentioned, today we will be uh, talking and discussing about certain texts, certain theories. And basically, I have titled my presentation, Locating Texts in the Post-Colonial Frame, Perspectives and Challenges. Now, when we want to approach a field such as post-colonial studies, the very first thing that one needs to do is to understand what is post-colonial. Now, if you want to understand what is post-colonial, you obviously also need to understand what is colonial then and what is pre-colonial. Now, if we wish to study this phenomenon in a chronological perspective, then obviously you understand that it is colonialism which is occupying center stretch. That is, colonialism in the middle, everything that had happened before colonialism goes to the realm of the pre-colonial and everything that happens after colonialism goes to the realm of the post-colonialism. That is the most important thing. The defining factor is that of colonialism. Now, if we wish to understand colonialism, one cannot understand it without understanding certain other very complex phenomena. One of them, and the most important one, is that of the phenomenon of racism. Now, we should not mis make the mistake of thinking that racism is a thing of the past. 
it is not and i will uh, argue why it affects our lives very strongly even today now if we want to understand and dissect the phenomena of racism first we need to understand that race is a construct you know it is not a given it is not a biological given it is a construct a societal construct and any societal construct has certain political and economic dimensions so does the construct of race if it is so then racism obviously is a discourse whenever there is a construct there will be a ground reality on which the construct would be built and to justify that construct a discourse will be created all isms that's how i look at it all isms are discourses and all discourses as the french theorist michel foucault wants us all discourses are suspect why should all discourses be suspect because no discourse floats in air that's not that's not how a discourse operates discourses are always located in ground reality and by ground reality i mean certain very brutal certain very violent certain very exploitative politico economic structures what does the racist discourse do it attempted to in the past and it still continues to justify and legitimize certain unfair certain unequal certain violent certain brutal certain exploitative eco political structures if we want to understand this construct of race we need to understand the two predominant theories of race the older one which was the polygenetic theory of race and the one which was established by charles darwin that is the monogenetic theory of race now in the polygenetic theory of race the black obviously was at the bottom the white at the top and the and the and the whites considered the blacks particularly to be a different species altogether you know so if if you do not belong to the same species then you know uh, you have a justification for exploiting the other species in the in the in the same way that uh, humans today think that they have the right to exploit all other species on earth right that was the polygenetic theory of race where the black the black race was considered to be a different species now with charles darwin and with the publication on the origin of species in 1859 we come to the monogenetic theory of race where it was scientifically proved that all of us all human beings belong to the same species that of the homo sapiens now there was a problem if we all belong to the same species then how do you justify the exploitation of one part of the species by another part so so a uh, there was another construct and this was the construct of the racial hierarchical ladder with the white man at the top followed by the white woman then you might have the brown man or the yellow man below that the brown woman the yellow woman then the black man and at the very bottom the rock bottom you have the black woman this was a as i explained a societal construct right now on your right you can see uh, a picture of the origin of species which i mentioned was published in 1859 and on the left you have a photograph of charles darwin now uh, this uh, i this is an a very interesting uh, 
picture. Please take a look at it. It is called um, Washing the Ethiopian or the Blackamoor White. Okay. And this, uh, this happens to be uh, the original Pierce Soap advertisement, which was, which was published in 1884. And this is based on the Aesop's fables. Now, this, this concept of uh, washing the Ethiopian or the Blackamoor white is a very strong uh, racist prototrope, you see? And it, and it dates back. Uh, right to uh, Greek times. It's not. It's it's nothing new. In fact, if you if you go to the Aesop's Fables, you have uh, a fable where uh, a black slave is being washed. The picture shows a black slave being washed by his new master because he believes that he has a lot of dirt accumulated on him as his former slave master did not treat him right. Now, one version of the story says that this constant washing made the black slave catch a cold and he dies of it, right? Now, this continued, you know, like uh, you have, uh, very interesting, you have uh, some someone like John Bunyan in Pilgrim's Progress, you have two characters, if you, if you have read that text, you have the fool and you have want wit, and they are shown washing the Ethiopian clean, right? Similarly, in Erasmus, you have the same story. You also have a complementary story of the uh, raven and the swan, where the raven wants the white feathers of the swan. And because he doesn't have it, he you know, kind of bathes and bathes and bathes in the stream and dies as a result of it. In this uh, for, uh, uh, picture that you see here, you see there is a white child and you see the black child in the tub. And look at the in the first picture. And in the next picture, if you look at it, you see the, the black child is shown with a white body. So this is what uh, the pure soap is supposed to do to you. Now, don't make the mistake of thinking that this happened in 1884. Because if you, uh, if you have been following the newspapers, you would have seen that Hindustan Lever, just a couple of days back, has decided that it would remove the term fair from its, uh, I mean, what should I say? It is its most famous product, the fair and lovely cream. And that I'm talking about 2020. And why is you, uh, Hindustan Lever doing it because Johnson & Johnson has decided that it would no longer sell whitening products in India. So you see, there is always a subtext of uh, economic political vantage that one has to understand. So just to explain how uh, racism works and how race as a construct works and how it is alive and kicking even in our times. Now, if we move on uh, to the phenomena of colonialism, this was a phenomenon with very powerful ramifications. If you look at uh, statistics, Europe represents only 8% of the planet's landmass, only 8%. But between 1492 to 1914, Europe had colonized more than 80% of the entire world. Can you imagine? 8% having colonized 80% of the world. And the heyday of colonialism was in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. The next important point, which I would want uh, the students to pay particular attention to, is what I like to call the zero point in history. Now, what is this uh, zero point in history? You see, the, it, it, it seems in all racist colonial discourse, it seems that the history of a colony begins at that point of time when the white man first sets his foot on a prospective colony. 
you see it's almost as if there was no history prior to the arrival of the white man in the colony anything that was there any history of the land and the people prior to the arrival of the white man is neatly and categorically relegated to the realm of prehistory which by default is the primordial dark or the pre colonial age now look at this photograph very carefully this is a uh, a very interesting and a very famous photograph of uh, it it is actually an engraving of uh, by uh, johannes stratonus and it is titled the discovery of america you know it is it is that moment where amerigo vespucci the florentine navigator first sets foot on america and awakens a sleeping america you see you see you see the way it is uh, imagined and you see the way it is engraved look at amerigo vespucci he is overtly and fully clothed look at the image of america she, it is a she america as a continent as a woman she is half lying on a hammock and she is naked right so it is the colonizer setting foot on the colony which he will colonize in the near future it seems as if the colony as a woman is waiting to be embraced by the colonizer now this is what i like to call the great colonial myth wherein rape is portrayed as romance what happened to the colonies in retrospect all of us know if you read your history you know but the way it has been portrayed in colonial literature and even later is what should interest us and what we should learn to look at critically so this is how rape is being portrayed as romance i will show you another picture now this is again america as woman with a with a headdress of feathers and an arrow you see and which obviously indicates the many indigenous cultures of america who today are all in the reservations now this is another important engraving by cornelius van dalen too who was a dutch engraver look at the background the landscape it is it is a typical indigenous village this is the this is the third one uh, this is by this is a personification of america as a gate this is by adrian collart and he was a flemish designer and engraver and here once again uh, if you look at the picture carefully you can see um, america once again a woman once again naked and this time riding on an armadillo on the on the left you can see a kind of uh, warfare going on between the indigenous community on your right you can see the colonial occupation has begun right now if we move a little further if we look at the concept of the colonial case the first i just explained to you how does the colonizer look at the colony he looks at the colony as a as virgin land continent and woman kind of coalesce and both of them seem to be waiting to be discovered that is to remove the cover to be uh, deflowered to be uh, in a way it is almost as if uh, the colony as woman is waiting for the great colonial romance to begin now this colonial gaze is also very interesting in the sense that it is partially blind in the sense 
that it does not seem to look at the local flora, the local fauna. It is blind. But very interestingly, it can see into the future. It can, it can look at the future rubber, coffee, tea plantations, which would dot the to be colonized landscape in the new, near future. Very interestingly, these are all cash crops, and this would bring in a lot of money for the mother country. This gaze is also very interesting in the sense that it can penetrate deep, very deep, right into the very bowels of the prospective colony. And, and what can it foresee? It can foresee the establishment of coal, diamond, gold, silver mines. Now, this, this is also a gaze which renders the local cultures and the peoples invisible. It is almost as if the colonial gaze depeoples the colonized land. You know, there is, there is nothing in the colonized land. There is only miles upon miles upon miles upon miles of fertile land waiting to be con uh, converted into plantations or mines or whatever the colonizer deems fit. The, the local people, the local cultures are completely erased. There is a depeopling of the land. Very interesting, and in a classic case of a colonial twist, the colonized land is then repeopled. Now, repeopled by whom? By the same invisible, erased population. They come back into the colonial narrative, but now they are no longer, you know, uh, the indigenous people of the land. They have become the colonized. And what are they expected to do? They are expected to work in the farms as laborers, in the, in the plantations as plantation workers, or in the mines as miners. So first, there is a, there is a kind of erasure or depeopling, and this is followed by a repeopling, where the indigenous population returns to the narrative as the colonized working population. Now, the next very important concept and which has kind of fascinated me is this concept of the cul cultural package. You see, when a colonizer came to a colony, he came with certain preconceived notions of the land and the people that he was expected to govern. You know, And this, this cultural baggage which the colonizer carried, it, it kind of rendered him blind. He was unable to learn or to accept the notions of different cultures. If you look at uh, your right, you will see this very interesting book. It is called The People of India. You see, following the revolt of 1857, many civil services officers, such as Temple, they thought that a better understanding of the colonial subject was necessary to avoid future unrest. If you remember Edward Said's Orientalism, he, he talks about knowledge being power. That is, if you want to govern your native, if you want to control your native within double quote, you must know your native. You know, knowledge of the native will enable you to govern your native. So, so what was done? An eight-volume official British government publication was pu compiled by Watson and Kay between 1868 and 1875. It had 468 annotated photographs about the native castes and tribes of India, and it was called the people of India. What you will be surprised to know is that it was mandatory for each Indian civil service officer to study these eight volumes before coming to India. Now, you try to understand an uh, Indian civil service officer coming to India from England would be maybe 26, 27, 28 years old. Before coming to India, he is being uh, 
uh, kind of compelled to read this and so he comes with his mind full of these notions about what to expect in india so obviously he will not see beyond that in the next two slides i will show you four of the annotated photographs from the people of india in this on your left you can see uh, one of a, a classic photograph this is it is titled the dandi and uh, it is actually uh, that is how they write it that's how watson and k write it a uh, hindu devotee it is in banaras on your right you can see the doshads and 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 it is qualified as low caste hindus from bihar now if i look at the next slide on your left you can see the photograph of a woman and it is of a lepcha woman now the lepchas as you know uh, today inhabit uh, parts of north bengal and sikkim and also they they form part of bhutan and nepal so a lepcha woman and on your right very interestingly this is from the chotanagpur plateau where all of us from jharkhand are located and you have a kol which we now spell as k o l but there it is spelled as c o l e and look they are already christians so you see colonialism has already set in quite well now the next uh, interesting aspect of colonialism is this arrogance this arrogance of the colonial master you know this uh, this this faith that they had the right to interpret any colonized culture and more so ever he believed strongly believed that his interpretation of the colonized culture was the only valid one now if we look at edward said's orientalism he coins this concept of the positionally privileged so if you occupy a positionally privileged place obviously you get to write your history and that is what the colonizer does and his interpretation of history continued to be the only valid one for decades upon decades upon decades now edward said along with homi ke bhaba and gayatri chakravarti pips pivak as we know these three were instrumental in initiating this academic field of post colonial studies and uh, i i like to think that together they kind of uh, form the holy trinity of post colonial studies now if you look at this slide very carefully uh, you will find that in the backdrop there is the there is the map of the world but it is an upside down map now what i have put in here is stuart macarthur's universal corrective map of the world which was launched in 1979 here you can see that africa is at the top so is uh south america and so is australia so if if uh, the earth is a globe you know if it is a sphere then who gets to define that, that what is on the north and so by default on the top and who are in the south and by default at the bottom now once again it is you see a a very interesting politics of cartography of map making you know Uh, the maps of the colonial age were made in such a manner that europe was placed at the top in the north so i mean this is how we need to decolonize we need to think about these issues now i would also like to talk about certain very very important and key concepts of uh, of of post colonial studies and one of them is the concept of othering you know you the self and the other now this the colonizer was engaged in constructing a binary opposition the opposition was between the self and the other the civilized and the savage or the barbaric the christian and the pagan or the heathen 
and the light versus darkness now another leading post colonial critic abdul jan mohammed in his essay manichaean aesthetics he talks about the dominant model of power and interest relations in all colonial societies is the manichaean opposition between the putative superiority of the european and the supposed inferiority of the native you see so the european is at the top whether it be the top of the race hierarchical ladder whether it is at the top of the uh, of the map of the world or whether it be at the top of the eco political structures and the native is supposed to be inferior and at the bottom what is even more interesting is the notion of the civilizing mission because you see as i explained to you earlier what is happening at the bottom at the rock bottom in real life is being justified by the ideology that has been constructed by the colonizer and that is floating as the discourse so the civilizing mission was the self justificatory ideology that was constructed by the colonizer how did the colonizer interpret himself in his own narrative he interpreted himself obviously if i if i write the history i would place myself in a very positive light and that is what the colonizer does he he portrays himself as the carrier of light what does he do he carries the light of knowledge from the mother country the center the metropolis to the colony the periphery the margin to dispel the inherent darkness there you see i have purposely uh, used the upper case for mother country center and metropolis and the lower case for colony periphery or margin because that is how the colonial world operated and unfortunately that is how the post or neo or ultra or pseudo colonial world in which we live today continues to operate the next important thing is obviously which is related to the civilizing mission is the myth of the white man's burden now this is also very interesting it is the white man who has the burden of civilizing the pagan or the heathen or the barbaric or the savage however you want to look at it every time i think of the white man's burden i i am compelled to think of another image that of white jesus as savior carrying a black cross on his shoulders because this again is a justificatory discourse which legitimizes the exploitation of the black colonized by the white colonizer what is happening in the ground is exploitation what is being portrayed in the discourse is some is just the reverse this is how the colonial discourse is being written the master narrative or the colonial narrative is being written now another very important concept is that of stereotyping now this stereotyping is something very interesting you know uh, and every time i think of stereotyping uh, there are two things that come to my mind one is that if you uh, tell a lie 1000 times finally people believe it to be the truth and another proverb which every time i think about it i am uh, i'm also scared you know it says that uh if a language is backed by a gun uh, i'm sorry if a, if a, if a dialect is backed by a gun it becomes a language what i'm trying to say in other words is how does stereotyping work now there are two things one is if you can write your discourse well and obviously you get to write the discourse if you occupy a position of power and if you can circulate it well enough it is established as the truth one of the best examples is uh, 
is the stereotyping of the entire continent of Africa. You see, it is an entire continent. It has 56 countries and several thousand communities. But how is it reflected in uh, narratives as one country? It is homogenized as one country. And similarly, all Africans are homogenized as collective beings. An African can be a Zulu from South Africa, an African can be, you know, a, a, an Igbo from Nigeria or an Iwe from Ghana, whatever. But no, an African is an African and all Africans are the same. This is how stereotyping and homogenization works. In the Indian context, it's very interesting. You see, prior to the revolt of 1857, when, uh, you know, the British colonial uh, machinery, which till then belonged to the East India Company, had a relatively uh, unthreatened rule. And so the portrayal of the adult Hindu colonized male was that of a docile and effeminate man. But you see, with 1857, the entire uh, structure, the British colonial structure was deeply threatened and shaken. You know, and we know that uh, in 1858, it is the, uh, you know, the British colonial government, which uh, takes over the reins of the government and Queen Victoria becomes the Empress of India. And the discourse changes. The erstwhile docile and effeminate Hindu male goes on to become sexually excessive and does not stop at that. He also becomes a compulsive rapist. You know, this is how the discourse around the Hindu male One, of course, is uh, you can look at the cover page on the on the right. So Joseph Conrad uh, was ahead of his times. You know, uh, there is no doubt about it. He could he could see the the nasty politics of greed and power, which was embedded in the imperial story. He was progressive, much more than most writers of his time, and yet and yet he stereotyped the blacks. And he was blind to the racist structures. And that is why you see his novel is titled Heart of Darkness. Why should Africa be the heart of darkness? Because simply, again, because the light from the mother country had not reached there. Now, this was written way back in 1899 published in England in 1902. And we come so many centuries down to Binyamanga Vainana, uh, who just passed away last year. He, was, he is one of the most brilliant voices in contemporary literature from Kenya. In his uh, short piece, How to Write About Africa, he, he talks about the prevalent stereotypes in the literature being written today. I will recommend all of you to read it, you know, because it is one of the finest satirical pieces written in recent times about the racist stereotypes and structures prevalent in present day so called post colonial literature. Now, if we move further, there is this another interesting uh, colonial tool that of ascription. Now, what was ascription? Now, this ascription was, you know, the, the fixing of certain negative characteristics, mostly imaginary, onto an othered or colonized culture to, de to dehumanize it or to demean it. it. Believe me, it was a very successful colonial tool. One of the most important and most notorious of colonial ascriptions was the ascription of cannibalism onto othered cultures. I have chosen 
two texts to explain it to you the concept of ascription one is robinson crusoe's daniel defo i'm sorry daniel defo's robinson crusoe and the other is lee miracles i am woman now daniel defo in robinson crusoe what does he show if you have read the text i'm sure all of you have you know that prides community and the community at war with prides community are both shown to be cannibals so darkness if you remember the boatmen who who row uh, marlo along the river congo are also shown to be cannibals now one has to understand that cannibalism does not really have a basis if you if you, you read the writings of the nigerian novelist chinwa achebe he explains it very beautifully what is the difference between human sacrifice and cannibalism and he says that when a society has reached rock bottom you know its back is against the wall it is completely cornered at that time the god might demand a human sacrifice it is it happens in the rarest of rare cases and when it happens then the sacrificial meat is eaten by the community and he says that perhaps the people who eat that meat suffer more pain than the man or the woman who is actually sacrificed there is nothing like one community hunting and eating another human community for the simple pleasure of eating human flesh that does not happen the second example that i have taken is from this text which is called i am woman and this is written by one of my most favorite writers lee maracle she is a native indian uh, writer that is an indigenous writer from canada in this book she writes something which gives me the goosebumps every time i speak about it she says that my community was also demeaned and the courses as a cannibalistic society and then she goes on to write and say that everything i know today each art that i know today has been taught to me by my grandma and then she says and my friends whatever they have learned they have learned it from their mothers and grandmothers and she says my grandma taught me to cook so many dishes now if human flesh was a delicacy you know if it was a delicacy in the community i am sure i would have been taught the recipe of cooking human flesh in different ways how is it that not a single recipe exists this is the question a very bold a very powerful question that lee miracle asks and 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 which obviously makes us think of ascription as a colonial tool to dehumanize or demean the other cultures if we move further now what was the major damage that colonialism did the major damage caused by colonialism was the internalization of these colonial stereotypes ascriptions in fact the entire negative discourse by the colonized you know it is not just that the colon colonizer you know uh, circulated it propagated it advocated it the worst was that the colonized internalized this negative discourse completely i will give you some examples of this kind of uh, internalization but before that i would like to tell you that a similar a similar phenomenon you can see in the internalization of the negative tenets of slavery by the enslaved 
it is another very interesting discourse and very closely connected to colonialism you see uh, in fact maya angelou talks about it in her in her autobiography uh, the afro american woman writer uh, maya angelou who passed away last year she she writes about it in her seven volume autobiography uh, in the fifth volume which is based on her travels in ghana and which, which is titled all god's children need traveling shoes she writes about how the slavers who should feel ashamed and who should feel the guilt for the crime of slavery do not it is the enslaved you know who feel the guilt it is it is a very strange world in which we live because all the negative tenets of slavery have been internalized by the enslaved and so it is they who carry the albatross around their necks the albatross of shame the albatross of uh, guilt now if we move to uh, the nigerian novelist uh, chinwa achebe's very interesting 1977 essay an image of africa racism in conrad's heart of darkness achebe says that he grew up reading conrad like many of us did you know and identifying with the lead character marlo if you have read conrad you know that it is marlo who goes on different voyages and all of us tend to identify with marlo but achebe says that it was much later and this is also a case of uh, kind of uh, decolonizing your mind when achebe realizes that when you are reading conrad and when you are a black man you are not supposed to be marlo you cannot identify with marlo you should identify actually with the black monkeys you know they are the homogenized africans who are shown to be jumping up and down on the banks of the river congo and achebe says that it came as a huge shock to him that this is what conrad had actually done now to give you another example and this this time the example is from uh, afro america and from uh, from 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 tony morrison's uh, classic novel the bluest eye if you have uh, read the bluest eye uh, you know it is about a 10 year old black black girl child by black black i mean a child who is uh, who is very black in fact this is what alice walker uh, another very important afro american writer calls the dirty little secret of afro american communities that is within their own community there is also the color line you see this is how uh, racism functions the racist tenets have also been internalized by the uh, blacks and so within the community also there is a demarcation of who is who can pass off as white who is high yellow who is mulatto who is quadroon and so on and so forth and at the very rock bottom you have somebody like pekola who is very black 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 and she has a 10 year old child just a 10 year old child she has internalized the white patriarchal paradigm of ideal feminine beauty in such a way in such a way that each night she prays fervently to wake up in the morning with a pair of blue eyes now tell me what can be worse a, a 10 year old child praying fervently to wake up in the morning with a pair of blue eyes and obviously that is will be associated also with blonde hair and fair complexion and a zero figure why would she want to do that she would want to do that only because without it she finds that she is not accepted even in her own society even in her own family you see this is how internalization works 
So I will give you another example. This time, uh, let's come to India and to Lord Macaulay, who, if you remember, was a member of the uh, Governor General's Executive Council and the President of the Committee of Public Instruction. In 1835, he submitted his famous Minutes on Education to Lord Bentinck, and which became, uh, uh, which was passed in 1835. Now, what had Lord Macaulay wanted to do? You know, he had wanted to construct, once again, construct. And this time, he had wanted to construct the perfect brown sahib. Now, what would this brown sahib be like? He would be a puppet parroting individual. In other words, he would be a person who had absolutely internalized the tenets of colonial discourse. That is, he would be white in thought and emotion, but brown in complexion. You see, he, he would never be the Pakka Sahib. He would always be the brown Sahib. And what would these brown Sahibs do? These brown Sahibs would act as the steel bulwark upholding the colonial structure. Now, if we move further in this discourse of internalization of the colonial discourse, I would like to talk about another very, very important uh, essay, and which I think all of us should read. It is uh, the French philosopher Louis Althusser's essay, Ideology and Ideological State Apparatuses, where he speaks of two kinds of state apparatuses, the ideological and the repressive. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, this <clears throat> repressive state apparatuses are very obvious because they are very visible. For example, the police. For example, the prison. The prison with its associated uh, connotations of the panopticon or the military. But the ideological state apparatuses uh, Louis Althusser wants are difficult to locate because they, they are very uh, surreptitious, they are very subtle, and they are nuanced, and they are almost invisible. And as examples, he gives the family, you know, the, the places, the religious places, but the most important ideological state apparatus is, he says, the education system. And since all of us are involved in it, I think it is of special importance to us. And he says that this, the education system is a classic example of the ideological state apparatus, primarily because it teaches an individual what to think, but it does not teach the individual how to think. In other words, it operates just the way Lord Macaulay had wanted the education system to operate, to create brown sahibs who would never be the pakka sahib and who would be white in thought and emotion and so help to uphold the exploitative structures. In fact, Lee Maracle, in, 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 the, in the book that I just mentioned, I Am Woman, talks of the education system. And she calls the schools, in the Canadian context, she calls the schools ideological processing plants. And she says that when a child enters kindergarten, his mind is like a raw material. But by the time he completes his uh, education, he may be a graduate or a postgraduate, whatever the case might be, he comes out as a finished product. And his mind, she says, is full of and, and, and to quote her, she says, it's full, covered to cover with the colonizer's nonsense. You know, that is how schools as ideological processing plants operate. To give you a, a very graphic examples, you know, in fact, I could not resist this. To give you a classic example from uh, Satyajit Ray's 1980 film, which in Bangla is called Hirok Raja Teshe. And in English, it's called Kingdom of Diamonds. 
uh, he shows this concept of internalization in its ultimate very graphic form in fact he so he shows uh, that this king who is obviously very rich because it is the kingdom of diamonds and at the same time he is very exploitative and like all kings he is surrounded by uh, a coterie of stooges you know psychophant stooges and um, he is he is threatened by the presence of a teacher who he thinks is teaching uh, the, the concept of revolution to the to the young students and also to the minors and so uh, the king says to his wizard that you have to devise something and the and the wizard who is called gobuchandra which actually in bangla means a fool he he devises a machine and this machine is called mogoj dholai jantra if we translate it into english it is brain washing machine if we translate it into hindi it is very easy it is magaj dhulai yantra right and the picture that you see on the right is that of the magaj dhulai yantra now what does the king do all these rebellious miners you know who were shouting down with the king they are inserted into this machine the door is closed and there are a lot of weird lights and sounds that you see and when the door is opened the same man has been brainwashed and he comes out saying and you can see it written hirokir raja bhagavan that is the king is god you see this is the ultimate portrayal of uh, internalization of brainwashing now if if it was so <clears throat> how is it that we have a post colonial age if if colonialism was you know so successful in its ramifications uh, how how is it that we can even talk of a post colonial age now i look at it this way uh, and uh, i i i look at these two deridian gaps you know the first deridian gap was or chasm was at the heart of christianity i'll tell you how it operated you see what did the christian uh, european civilized colonizer want he wanted to bring light he wanted to bring religion to the uh savage to the barbarian so in most uh colonial uh, countries uh, either it was the colonizer who went first or it was the missionary who went first you know either missionary followed by colonizer or colonizer followed by missionary fine now what did missionary the missionaries and the colonizers wanted to do one of the main things that they wanted to do was to convert the native to their own religion now herein lies the uh, gap herein lies the beauty of the uh, process that is if a pagan is converted to christianity obviously he also becomes a christian so he is no longer a pagan so if he is also a christian if a black is also a christian and if the colonizer is also a christian then they both become equals in the eyes of jesus and now if both are equal in the eyes of jesus the bible obviously does not permit the exploitation of a fellow christian now this is where the gap lay and this gap was utilized by the nationalist movements now there was a similar gap at the heart of colonialism now if you have read your robinson crusoe well and i think it is a text that needs to be read with a lot of care we find that who learns the language it is friday friday learns the language of crusoe who converts to crusoe's religion it is friday you see obviously crusoe will not learn friday's language because he does not even think that friday has a language and obviously he will not convert to crusoe's religion because he thinks crusoe has no religion so obviously if friday has begun to read 
he will read everything that crusoe has and that is what happened and i have given just one example the colonized would not just read what the colonizer had written he would read more for example he would read about the concepts of the french revolution the concepts of equality liberty and fraternity and think why would it not apply to him this is a question which he would obviously ask now that takes me to uh, shakespeare's the tempest and sometimes uh, i feel that obviously it can be read as the first post colonial text because it is here where caliban challenges prospero and i have quoted two lines from it that is you taught me language and my profit on it is i know how to curse in other words you have taught me your language and i thank you for it for now i will be able to curse you in your own language and you will be able to understand in fact what is the point of cursing if the party who is cursed does not understand it right so so there is obviously uh, with this is obviously associated the entire politics of in which language should one write and that brings us to the debate between chinua achebe and nagugi wotyongo where they talk about whether the <clears throat> uh, the erstwhile colonized country writers should write in their own uh, languages or whether they should write in english now from 1940s onwards you have the era of the nationalist movements you know uh there is a change in discourse because the writing of history has begun from the perspective of the colonized in fact uh if you like to call it post colonial writing that had already begun in the last phase of colonialism and in fact one of the first examples of that is chinua achebe's things fall apart which was published in 1958 if you remember nigeria went on to become independent in 1960 on your uh, on your right you can see the uh, frontispiece of things fall apart's first edition now the nationalist movements had begun the writings you know had begun and a, a nationalist discourse was also uh constructed and it also began to be circulated but we as scholars of post colonial studies we cannot afford to be blind you know we have to uh, filter the information very carefully for example these nationalist discourses also show very clear hierarchies in fact and and this is irrespective of the colonies you know the voices of women in almost all discourses tribals in those societies which are uh, predominantly non tribal dalits in a in a society like ours and the lower classes these are hardly present in the elite nationalist discourses in fact Uh, dipesh chakraborty in his 1992 essay post post coloniality and the artifice of history who speaks for indian past speaks of these internal repressive regimes and asks that all of us need to be aware of these uh, repressive regimes to conclude you know i would like to uh, raise a few questions now when does a, a country become post colonial you know does the technical grant of political sovereignty does it usher in an era of post colonialism like once the country is technically independent technically sovereign does it really make the country post colonial post with a hyphen how can it when the, the white imported colonizers are today replaced by black or brown or yellow whatever home grown stooges who can be dictators who can also be democrats you know if this is so if the if the structures of violence if the structures of brutality 
if the structures of domination if the structures of exploitation if the structures of inequality if these have not changed has the country really become post colonial this is a question which all of us need to think about very deeply debate about you know earlier you see the physical presence of the colonizer was required now even that is not required because uh, in this world of uh, advanced technology everything is remote controlled by the west right so so what we have is actually a new era a new era of neo colonialism you can call it neo colonialism you can call it you know pseudo colonialism you can call it ultra colonialism whatever you want to call it because the the structures of inequality have not changed you know in fact today there is a rampant economic and cultural invasion you know a, a kind of imperialism from the west and uh, in 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 this world in which we are living um the world dominated by uh, social media a world which is uh, called the world of post truth in this era uh, i personally feel the consumer has become the consumable you know you you do not even realize when you are being consumed by a society which is essentially malignant and invasive but this is what is happening right what has happened is that the terminologies have changed the vocabularies have changed uh you know it is it is like a, a a kind of a new packaging that has been given but the essential structures continue to be repressive that has not changed so we perhaps need to think instead of a post colonial or a neo colonial we perhaps need to think of a post exploitative era and perhaps we have to think very uh carefully as to how to unlearn what we have been you know internalizing for centuries how to unlearn how to decolonize the mind how to think further than being located in our own ivory towers and uh, i would like to uh, conclude with what arvind adiga uh, in fact i have shown uh, the Uh, front cover of that what arvind adigar says in the white tiger if you remember he says that if all of us lie on our couches or on our sofas tuned in to our color televisions and uh, you know watch uh, the detergent and soap advertisements and think that the change that we want the revolution that we want would come from somewhere else you know somebody else would come uh, to do your revolution for you that is not going to happen you know in fact that is what chinwa achebe also says that your revolution will have to come from your land you know it can be it will be slow it will be piecemeal it may be haphazard but nonetheless it has to come from you in fact in other words you have to be a part of the change that you want to see nobody else can do it for you thank you i am open to questions comments observations thank you very much ma'am for this amazing classroom experience you have given us a lot today and now the session is open for questions um, i request the students friends who have joined here to kindly drop their questions they can unmute and ask their question to any questions hello yes ganeshta ma'am ma'am i have two questions my first question is according to cornet the blacks or the africans are cannibals whereas while going through the novel we find that white people take pleasure in shedding blacks blood 
like we see that massacre that happened there so is it not that whites are ideological cannibals and blacks are the victims and my second question is towards the end of the novel we find that the last words that kurt say is the horror whereas ma whereas marlo sees that towards his last time kurt was speaking of his wife so isn't it that the corner is trying to he is trying to present the idea in uh, covered words that during that time obviously it was not possible to write against white people so he somehow tried to distract people through his writing uh see with your uh, first um, observation you know of uh, whites being ideological cannibals i agree you know that is what uh, we have been observing for uh, very long in fact i told you that uh, these constructs these prototypes these stereotypes these ascriptions they have a very long history and they are still continuing so obviously it is the uh, white man you know who is kind of uh, using his cannibalistic instincts on to the blacks or the browns or the yellows whatever the case might be but so far as uh, conrad is concerned as i told you remember conrad himself is polish but he is white so if you remember uh, he was one of the most progressive uh, people of his own generation and that is why he could look into the uh, you know into the mockery that was the imperialist uh, process that he could but at the same time one has to remember that one is always located uh, situated with certain affiliations uh, so to be completely objective is never possible and that is why michel foucault says that as i told you one has to be suspect of all discourse and that is why uh, you even though conrad had a fine mind you know he could not really uh, overcome the racist structures which were prevalent in his own time and that is why uh, we, you have such a such a depiction of coot says mistress for example or the way coot says himself uh, portrayed or as i mentioned to you the way the blacks are portrayed in the entire text or even the title of the text these are issues which we need to think about thank you ma'am ma'am i have one more question ma'am while i was reading yes. a taste of honey a uh, few days back i was reading a taste of honey in that drama there there are two characters helen and joe helen sees that her mother is not concerned about color she is liberal person she is a radical person but her daughter joe when she gets pregnant by a black boy she says that she wants to kill her child and at the same time that boy has left her and uh, she time and again when they were quoting each other says that there is still jungle in you ma'am is it not that there is kind of biological mm-hmm. war going on that a black person or a black child is a waste to community they are superior to blacks but they are inferior to whites is it can we think of something like that that it was going on during that time no i did not get your question i mean are you trying to say that uh, 
uh, there is this in, in this inferiority and superiority thing it exists is it is it what you are trying to tell yes ma no what i was trying to argue was exactly against this you see that these are all structures and because these structures have been internalized you know they are constructs they have been internalized so well that you start believing that they are the truth it is the same you know in the case of patriarchy you know uh, in fact uh, many of you must have read the second sex where simon de beauvoir says that you are not born a woman you know you become one and how do you become one because you internalize all the tenets of patriarchy in a in a similar way you know uh, racism works in a similar way you 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 have internalized the tenets of racism in such a way that you have come to associate black with evil and white with good although there is no reason to do so in fact it is just the reverse but that is how uh the process of internalization works and that is why we have to be very careful yes ma'am thank you ma'am uh, does that answer your question mm -hmm. yes mm. ma'am thank you ganeshta any more questions please yes. uh yes ma'am i have one question hello hello yes yes please, please go ahead yes uh ma'am uh, as fanon uh, explained that uh, that white man is still in his whiteness and black man uh, in his blackness so there is a two vicious circles and black man white man wants to prove his superiority and uh, black man wants to talks about his past that we have a black, uh, we have a very glorious past so there is a two vicious circle so how will overcome this two vicious circle yeah it is that's what i said na that one has to uh, unlearn the the first thing that is uh, about education is about not learning it is about unlearning you know all the uh stuff that has been drilled into your mind you need to unlearn those things that is the first thing that one needs to do that is what gugui bothiongo talks about also in about when we talks about decolonizing the mind you see if you uh, you were talking about franz fanon uh, what does he say he says that uh if one human being hates another human being for a certain reason it is valid but if an entire community hates me because of the color of my skin is there any logic in that that was that community does not even know me as an individual human being that community recognizes me as a collective being all africans are black so by default all africans are evil so obviously you understand that there is no logic in it there is no uh, scientific uh, you know substantial you know it cannot be scientifically substantiated nothing of that sort so the the human mind has been very carefully uh, damaged by this kind of colonial uh, master narratives and so we have to learn how to overcome this and that is what achebe says you know I, that's why i give you that example he says that i thought i was marlo and it was only later that i realized that i was not marlo i was one of those black monkeys jumping up and down on the banks of the river congo so that is the moment of realization you know you have to learn how to decolonize your own mind uh, 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 i hope i answer your question yes ma'am yes ma'am i have another uh, i i don't just want to uh, another explanation so as we are colonized country as india Uh, so we are in still we are in the process of uh, decolonization we entered in the process of decolonization that uh, we are still very uh, colonized in fact you know i tell my students some of them might have joined also that look at uh, 
your location you are located at a place called brambe which is very close to the capital city of rachi it happens to be in the orao or kuduk heartland okay 5 kilometers from the university you have the murma jatra which happens every year on the 6th day after dashami that is durga puja dashami but almost none of the students know the significance of the murma jatra how do they envision the murma jatra it is a place to go and just enjoy the fair and come back none of them know that this is uh, this is a you know there is the dharam khuta there which united which unites all the uh, sub communities of the orao's and the orao and munda community and that there is a host of stories behind it it is the focal point of two communities they do not know they would stay there five years maybe more and go away without knowing why is that that is because of the cultural baggage that we all carry believe me we are all racists we are uh, each one of us is a blatant ra racist you know the students would come the students would study in the university for 5 years and then they would go away without knowing these things why because they think there is nothing to know what is there to know from these places or these people you know you are already ensconced in your superior ideology you see so you see you have to begin at home just like charity begins at home you see decolonization also begins at home you have to begin with your own mind you know this is how it begins you have to be more perceptive you have to see around you you know you cannot lock yourself up and uh, practice uh, decolonization it doesn't happen that way thank you so much ma'am thank you any more questions more questions Okay, ma'am. There is a question from Richa in the comment section. If you can check. So she writes. Uh, Richa has written. Gayatri Spivak says yeah, that you, yes, it, is, it is more important to redistribute than to learn. What does she mean by redistribution? has academia made the concept of post colonial just another consumable product sometimes you know i i i feel so you know that uh, in this in this kind of a consumerist society where uh, individuals are being converted into consumables obviously uh, any discipline you know that is also up for consumption and uh, we all sit and debate you see we all sit and debate and we talk about uh, redistribution but to me it seems you know that uh, redistribution can only happen after unlearning you know unless you unlearn that is one and unless you connect number 2 you know things are not going to work you you can in fact i was listening to a very interesting lecture by some stalwarts on queer studies uh, just a few days back and i was thinking that what is the significance of of uh, talking about who gets to write in english and who gets to write in the vernacular when the average uh, hijra when the average hijra in the rural uh, societies of india suffers each day each night multiple times you see so where is the connect where is the connect and if we do not connect obviously these this will become uh, products that will be up for sale and uh, just like your intelligence will also be up for sale in fact uh richa on a personal note i all i i feel you know that i can forgive everything but i cannot forgive uh, uh those intellectuals who are willing to sell their intelligence as a as a consumable if that answers your question
yeah i think it does it does um uh, thank you richa <laughs> so uh i think uh, we, we we don't have any more questions okay yes, no shaba am i audible yes please go yes. ahead okay uh, ma'am uh, can we trace the essence of operation from victorian age or before that because you know i have read in many novels uh, such as samuel richardson's pamela oliver twist's uh, dickens and oliver twist or in uh, pygmalion gb shaw's pygmalion uh, there was a class distinction between higher class and lower class and but now the distinction is bla between blacks and whites So, ma'am, uh, please put a light uh, in this context. No, no. Uh, uh, I wish it was as simple as that. It's not like that, you know. These all these are intertwined. You know, there are. Uh, it is not as if uh, there is only the race division. Of course, there is this black and white. But along with that, there will al also be the dimension of class, the haves and the have-nots. as franz fanon would say there would also be the gender dimension you know the patriarchal structures there will also be the religious structures there will also be the uh, queer or i mean the sexual orientations these are these are all very important uh, dimensions of society and they all work together in tandem it is not this or this or this unfortunately you have to face all of these together in fact uh, i would like to uh, illustrate with an example from alice walker's the color purple where uh, when uh, <clears throat> celie the central character decides to leave home her husband albert who is a, a patriarch of the worst order and also a wife batterer he says uh, what can you do and then he qualifies it by saying you poor you woman you black you nothing do you understand you poor that is class you black that is race you woman that is gender and together you nothing this is how it works you know together it doesn't work uh, in 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 compartments that is the tragedy Okay. Thank you, Noshiba. I think that was the last question. Okay. Ah, uh, Noshiba, you can mute yourself, please. So, <laughs> thank you very much, ma'am, for being so patient and for your time. for uh, your uh, cooperation um this was the last lecture of the series and i believe nothing would have been a better conclusion for this series than your lecture it was absolutely delightful for all of us and i think the students have got to understand a lot today um they are quiet because i think they are usually quiet when uh, you know they they take in a lot of stuff otherwise they uh, are uh, you know they turn they behave somewhat different but today they are quite differently quite which means that they have absorbed a lot today and yes uh, uh, there are amazing uh, uh, comments coming up to you ma'am so thank you thank you very much for this beautiful session thank you for taking time for us it means a lot i know that you keep really busy you have been absolutely Uh, stuck with a lot of things, but you took time for us. It means a lot to us. So thank you very much, ma'am, for being with us today. Thank you, Varsha. It was a pleasure. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. This was the last session of the ongoing series, and with this, we come to an end of the complete series. We will be back with some more interesting stuff very soon. but till then take care goodbye thanks a lot everybody